Hello Golden Toads, I'm Benjamin Carlson, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about the content of this week's readings, Environmental Impact Assessment, with particular emphasis on one facet of the EIA process, public participation. It is inherently a very dry topic, so I'll be doing my very best to make it as interesting as possible. In today's world of exploding human populations and the corresponding exponentially increasing rate of development, the environment tends to take a back seat. One of the most powerful tools built into our legislature, designed to mitigate the damage done to our natural world, is environmental impact assessments. They force the proponents of a specific development to, while not necessarily alter, at least consider the potential environmental impacts of their actions. I'm now going to briefly touch on key elements of the EIA process, which will be expanded upon throughout this week's discussion. The EIA summarises the environmental impacts of the proposed development, but it also details the potential social and economic effects. It presents these negatives alongside the identified positives in a succinct manner, so it can be readily understood and hopefully acted upon by decision makers. Not only does it require the proponents and decision makers to consider the negative environmental ramifications of the development, but it also makes this information available to the public. The decision makers can still decide to go ahead with the proposal, even if catastrophic impacts are highlighted in the report, but they do so now with full knowledge and thus legal liability of the impacts. An EIA usually moves sequentially through four steps or stages. The first is screening. This stage determines whether the development that has been proposed will, under the legislation that is relevant, require environmental assessment. Simplified, this is just whether or not the development has the capacity to damage the environment in a significant manner. The second stage is scoping. During this phase it is determined what the potential impacts may be and possible alternatives to the proposed development and thus which areas require further investigation as part of the EIA. The team who will be conducting the study is then briefed with this information. During the scoping process an opportunity is provided for the initial involvement of the public. The third is the creation of the environmental impact statement. This is one of two important deliverables of the EIA process. It is a document that contains the gathered information on the current environmental conditions on the site, the likely environmental impacts of the proposed development, potential means of mitigating these impacts, and a discussion and subsequent evaluation of alternatives. The final step is the review of the EIA by the relevant government officials and interested members of the public. The document's accuracy is first evaluated and then it is discussed whether, given the identified impacts, the proposal should proceed. This information is collated in the final deliverable, the assessment report, which is ultimately handed to the decision makers of the development. An integral element of the EIA process is that of public participation. This, as it quite clearly sounds, is simply the involvement of the public in the decision making process. It is the opportunity for civilians to express their perceptions of the development in question, and as it forms part of the assessment report, have this taken into account by the decision makers when considering the proposal. In 1971, Khan and Khan described the value of public participation as residing in three forms. Firstly, it utilises a resource that otherwise would have been left unused, and secondly, it is an additional reservoir of knowledge that increases the accuracy of the decision making process. The third and final identified positive aspect is that public participation throughout the assimilation of the assessment radically decreases the chance of public backlash at a later date, streamlining and expediting the entire process. It has also been suggested by Elliot that a fourth point is added, that public participation simply leads to better decision making. While public participation is generally viewed as being of benefit to the overall decision making process, there are some negatives, as identified in 1985 by Molesworth some of which are that only members of the public with relevant technical and scientific knowledge can contribute to the decision-making process in a positive manner, and also often the involved public can be quite subjective and not view the wider ramifications of the decision. The level of public participation dictates its impact on the decision-making process. In 1971, Einstein suggested the three broad categories that describe levels of participation that were later broken up into eight subcategories by Sewell and Phillips. The first and lowest level of participation is non-participation. This is broken down into manipulation, sensor security, and information. The second of Einstein's levels of participation is tokenism, with the subcategories of consultation, placation, and collaboration. The third and highest level of public participation is the empowerment of individuals. This is broken into delegated power and community control. The level of public participation sought by the proponent of a specific development and the desired objective for participation will delineate when the input of the public begins. As a general rule, the earlier the public participation is sought, the more beneficial it is to the EIA process. It is important that a sufficient period of time is allowed for the desired objectives of participation to be reached. 
Other key aspects of the timing of public participation include having an adequate level of collated information ready prior to public involvement so they can both understand the situation and respond. It is also integral that the participation phase is not overly extended, as this directly correlates to an increase in the uncertainty and thus negativity of the public. It is important to scrutinise the parties involved in public participation and should thus be aware that they do not represent a perfect cross-section of society. Almost all participants are those that are adversely impacted by the proposed development, educated, middle class, have social influence, and thus feel confident in their involvement. Conversely, those that benefit from the proposition generally remain uninvolved. However, some members of the public do not elect to participate, despite being potentially negatively affected by the decision-making process's outcome. These include ethnic minorities, those that are physically or mentally disadvantaged, those that are not aware of the discussion over the proposal, or those that perceive the impacts of the development being far in the future. I hope that I have managed to convey at least some of the fundamental elements of this week's readings. Throughout the rest of the week, we will build on this foundation of knowledge through the discussion questions. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Thanks for listening. These are the questions for the week. I'm going to put questions 1 to 3 up at the beginning of the week and 4 to 5 up after Wednesday.